So good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's a really great pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, there's lots of familiar faces and names in the audience. So thanks a lot for uh, making the time. Uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be presenting uh, our uh, new book with uh, my colleague, uh, Augusto Valeriani. Um, and I need to acknowledge his contribution, first and foremost. He's been a fantastic co-author and uh, uh, really partner in crime in uh, trying to figure out uh, some really difficult questions. Um, I need to thank the Italian Ministry of Education and Research for funding uh, this project very generously. And in addition, I need to thank uh, many of you, uh, a community of scholars uh, with whom uh, I have spoken about the themes of the book, uh, who have helped me clarify many of the issues discussed in the book, um, and who have provided you know, support and guidance. Uh, the, the book is a very long acknowledge, uh, acknowledgement section uh, and, and uh, rightly so, because this book has uh, really uh, been discussed and uh, uh, developed uh, during a very long process. We uh, wrote the grant application, I believe, in 2011, got funding in 2012, and the book is out, uh, well, was out la at late last year. So obviously it was a long process, uh, but we hope one that, uh, uh, that was worth it uh, for you uh, and for our readers. So uh, I'm going to give a very, very brief overview and apologies if I'm going to cut you know, a lot of corners, but uh, there will be time for uh, addressing those issues in the Q&A. Uh, when we started writing uh, this book, we thought there were three uh, limits uh, in research on social media and political participations. Uh, let me be clear, we don't want to create a straw man. Uh, there are uh, uh, papers and articles that, that don't fall foul of these limits. Uh, but overall, the, the body of research as it was developing uh, uh, when we uh, developed the project for the book suffered in general from these limits. One was an idea that social media affordances were some sort of destiny. And I think the best example of this is the debate on echo chambers. Uh, you know, when uh, it became clear that users could choose who to follow on social media, uh, then a lot of people jumped to the conclusion that uh, this must mean that everybody is going to only choose to follow politicians they like, and they're only going to hear about politicians or political ideas uh, that they already agree with. Therefore, they're all going to be enveloped in echo chambers. Therefore, political polarization will increase. Um, and we think this is plausible, but not a necessity, not a destiny. Um, and we think it's more productive to treat this as an empirical question. So yes, there are technological affordances on social media, but there are many of them, and they are used by people in different ways that change over time. Uh, the platforms are always tweaking those affordances. So instead of focusing on affordances as a destiny, we focus on the experiences that people have on social media that might result from these affordances, but also result from their own use of these affordances. The second fallacy we identify is what we call a one-size-fits-all fallacy. In most research on social media and participation, there is a focus on what do social media do to people? Uh, whereas we believe there is a lot of value in looking at differences between individuals. People are different, uh, for example, and, cre and crucially for us, some people are very engaged in politics and interested in it, and they get a lot of information, and others don't. And we believe there is uh, reason to believe that uh, uh, social media might have different effects on these different groups of people. Uh, finally, the contextual vacuum fallacy. Most research on social media ignores context because it's focused on a single country. Most of the times, the United States, uh, which is a very exceptional, particular political system and media system. Uh, as a result, we don't really know what the role of context is, and we don't even know whether the American-based findings would translate elsewhere. Uh, so uh, in response to that, we conducted a comparative research where we look at uh, system level characteristics differentiating between countries based on uh, different features of their political and media systems. Um, Political interactions on social media are our key uh, uh, focus. And we believe there are three levels uh, in which we can conceptualize these. One is our key focus uh, in terms of our independent variables. And we call these political experiences. These are the ways in which citizens encounter and experience politics on online social media. Uh, then there is political citizenship, which is a much more purposeful activity uh, having to do, for example, with discussing politics or uh, searching for political information, uh, but crucially, not aiming at generating a specific political outcomes. So we might talk about politics with other people informally, but we're not necessarily trying to change their minds or achieve a certain political outcome. 
And then there is political participation, which is our key dependent variable. And that entails forms of political actions that are deliberately aimed at achieving specific political outcomes. Um, and so in our book, we basically look at the relationship between the first and the third uh, item on this, on this list. Uh, do political experiences on social media, which are relatively passive forms of encountering content on social media, uh, correlate with, for, with levels of political participation, which are purposeful specific activities that people do to achieve a certain outcome. Whether they succeed or not doesn't matter to us as long as they uh, they, 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 they want to achieve that outcome. And in terms of political citizenship, we control for these variables uh, in our models, but we don't focus on them specifically. So how do we conceptualize political participation? This is, of course, a very long and interesting debate, uh, which has developed greatly over the past 20 years, not least as a result of the advent of the internet and social media. So we conceptualize political participation as a fluid set of repertoires of political action, spanning across face-to-face -face and digitally enabled activities uh, and aiming to exercise influence on politically relevant outcomes. So first of all, we don't differentiate between face-to-face -face and, and online activities, uh, not only because as you know, my colleague Andrew Chadwick says, we are in a hybrid media system, but because you know, those distinctions are, are increasingly untenable. And you know, we wrote this, most of this book before COVID, but if anything, you know, one of the things we've learned during the, the, the lockdowns is that we can continue be politically, being politically engaged, even if we can only act online. Um, and the other key point is that these activities aim to exercise influence on politically relevant outcomes. Now, what do we mean by this? We differentiate between three targets uh, uh, that people might aim to influence with their participation. Uh, the first two are classic in political science literatures. The primary targets are policy decisions, like when you sign a petition because you hope Parliament is going to change some legislation, uh, when you um, uh, 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 subscribe a referendum because you want to directly change some policies. The secondary target, the secondary targets are uh, have to do with the selection of public officials who make these decisions on on our behalf. So uh, when you, for example, donate money to a party or volunteer for a party during a campaign uh, to in hopes that they will be elected. And then there is a third level, which most literature on participation really ignores, which is uh, actions that aim to influence other people's political preferences and actions. And we believe it's very important to focus on those as well, because you know once you've voted once, you can't vote twice unless you want to cheat. But if you try to influence other people and you succeed, your influence might multiply. And ironically, a lot of the literature in political participation doesn't focus on these kinds of interpersonal influences because mostly conceptualized participation is something that has to affect elites one way or another. And we believe that this needs to be expanded. So uh, at its simplest, our book is about the relationship between the three variables that you see depicted here on the uh, left uh, of this slide, exposure to political content people agree with, accidental exposure to political information and exposure to political mobilization on social media and political participation uh, to, to the right of the figure. Uh, of course, we do not make the strongest causal claims because this study is based on surveys, on self-reports, on cross-sectional data. It has a lot of limitations. It's not a field experiment. Uh, you would need to ask you know, Facebook or Instagram to run those if you really wanted to get at these questions, and I'm sure they are, but they're not telling us the results. Uh, then we, uh, add, on a second step, we look at whether different kinds of political attitudes moderate the relationships between the variables on the right, on the left, and the variable on the, on, on the right. So do people with different levels of political attitudes respond differently in terms of their political participation when they are, for example, exposed to political mobilization on social media? And this is really a question about political equality, as I will uh, explain shortly. And finally, in terms of our you know, contextual vacuum fallacy and how to get out of it, we look at systemic features. So we have nine different democracies, which I will explain in a second, and we uh, classify them based on the differences uh, and similarities they have in terms of different political systems and media systems, and we look at whether they make any differences in these relationships that we're interested in. So we have nine Western democracies in our uh, um, case selection. Uh, Denmark, France, Germany, Greece, Italy, Poland, Spain, the UK, and the US. We conducted post-election surveys in each of these countries uh, right after the, the last general election in the time frame between 2015 and 2018. We have a decently sized samples for each country. Um, 
constructed to match the population in terms of key demographic variables. Uh, importantly, we applied course and exact matching to our data. Uh, and I will not go into detail about what this technique does in, in, in practice, but uh, in, uh, for, in, as a shorthand, um, it uh, reduces the data to only include uh, cases that can be compared uh, based on certain variables in terms of whether they did or did not experience uh, each of the three political experiences on social media we're interested in. It's basically a way to compare apples and apples rather than apples and oranges uh, when you try to make some causal inferences based on observational data. Now, on the left-hand side, so the variables that we are interested in uh, in terms of political participation, uh, we looked at six different variables, uh, which you can see here, and they uh, captured different dimensions of primary, secondary, and tertiary influence. And as you can see, they're distributed quite differently in our sample. Some of them are very popular, others are, are very rare. Um, and when we combine them into an index, we see that most people actually don't participate in any activity. Uh, and to the extent that people participate in any activity, they participate in only one, uh, which we take as a sign that these are normal people that we interviewed. That they're not the kinds of political junkies that sometimes end up in online samples. Uh, we have rather rich and complex uh, regression models that we use to estimate our, our key uh, relationships of interest. So first of all, we're interested in the main effects so whether people exposed to different levels of agreement and disagreement on social media, uh, who are accidentally exposed to political news on social media, and who are exposed to political mobilization on social media, how do these variables relate with their levels of participation? Then we look on a second step at differential effects in terms of interest in politics, attention to the campaign, ideology, and populist voting behavior. Uh, we might not have a lot of time to get uh, into all of these uh, during this presentation, but I'm sure they'll come up in Q&A. Um, and we have a variety of control variables, which hopefully allow us to take care of any spurious uh, correlations. Um, so just in terms of, just to give you a sense of the, the, the independent variables we have and how they are distributed, um, as you can see here, uh, and this is a descriptive finding, but one that we found, we thought was very compelling. Most people are not in an echo chamber. Um, we use two very simple questions, asking people how often they agree and disagree with the political opinions and messages they see on social media. And uh, we combine their responses. And as you can see, uh, very, very few people uh, most more often agree than disagree with the content they see on social media. Most people believe that they see equal proportions of content they agree or disagree with. And that's an interesting uh, counter to the prevailing idea of echo chambers on social media. Uh, also, people very frequently get exposed to political news on social media accidentally when they were doing something else. And about one third of our participants uh, claim that they had been reached by messages uh, trying to convince them to vote for one party or one leader, which is how we operationalize political mobilization. So how do these variables matter for political participation? Um, these are um, predicted uh, probabilities, uh, predicted uh, levels of participation on a scale from zero to six um, for an average respondent who has different values in, in the variable, uh, uh, which is our focus here, which is uh, levels of agreement and disagreement. So if you are in what we call supportive uh, political environments where you're more likely to see messages you agree with than disagree with, you participate more and significantly so than if you are in an environment where most people disagree with you or where it's half and half. So in a way, echo chambers are very uncommon uh, based on our findings, but they do push people to participate more, which supports literature uh, dating from the era of you know, face to face interpersonal conversations by Diana Mutz and others, which had found the same thing. So echo chambers are not as common, but they do boost political participation. Accidental exposure to political news on social media doesn't have quite as strong an effect, although it does, uh, in, you know, levels of participation increase a bit uh, as people um, are more encounter uh, political news accidentally more frequently. In a regression model, the coefficient for accidental exposure is significant. But as you can see here, when you project those probabilities on an average respondent, you don't really see a major effect. Uh, political mobilization has the clearest effect. So if you have been invited uh, by someone else on social media to vote for a party or a candidate, that could also include seeing a political advertisement for a candidate, of course, uh, then you're going to be much more likely to, to participate in politics at the, at, the deeper, at the deeper level. 
Now, this, if you, these, if you want, are the, less, the least interesting results. Where we think the most interesting results are uh, is in the differential effects. So what about political attitudes? Uh, I'm not going to into great detail about this in the interest of time, but basically uh, when we looked at, when we started theorizing how political experiences on social media might affect people with high and low levels of political involvement, uh, we uh, departed from the mainstream of the literature at that time, which was still very much influenced by the uh, early 2000s literature, which argued because the internet is this information superhighway where people have to select what they want to see, uh, only people who care about politics will select political content. Uh, and therefore, people who don't care about politics will not benefit from any political information available online. The rich will get richer, politics as usual. Uh, we actually argue on social media, the equation should have changed because social media are pervasive. They are, uh, you know, people spend three hours and a half every day on social media. And almost everyone in our interpersonal networks is on social media and people differ in what they share. So even though we might not, one person might not care about politics, some of their friends might. And these people are still your friends. Uh, you're not gonna block them if they occasionally share some political content or some news. Um, maybe you'll block them if they share news about a football team you don't like. Um, but we argue social media might be mechanisms through which the least informed, the least involved in politics might get meaningful contact with political information. And among those people, the effects of that content should actually be higher than the effects on the same content on a political junkie. Because a political junkie already has the information, is already engaged, is already switched on, doesn't need a friend on Facebook to tell them what's going on today in, in the British Parliament. Uh, but somebody who isn't as involved might really benefit a lot more from those informal interactions about politics on social media. And so this leads us to argue that we should actually see a, an equalizing effect uh, to the extent that people get exposed to political experiences on social media, the ones that we uh, uh, are looking at, the people who are less interested in politics should experience a greater participatory boost than the people who are more interested in politics. Uh, and we find that this is the case. So here, for example, we look at the differential effects of encountering supportive political content, so being in an echo chamber, if you will, uh, among the very interested compared to the moderately interested, the slightly interested, and the not at all interested. And as you can see, you know, the, the, the um, x-axis represents increases in, in political participation. The less interested you are, the more your participation grows. And the same goes for accidental exposure here. The less interested you are, the more your participation grows if you encounter information accidentally on social media. And the same for political mobilization. Um, and this also applies to attention to uh, the campaign as another moderator. Another thing we looked at, uh, which I'm sure will also come up in the Q&A, is the idea that, okay, you know, if social media are this equalizing force, could this also mean that they bring barbarians to the gates? That, you know, the kinds of people that social media might lead into the democratic process are not necessarily very well informed, Maybe they don't even espouse very strong democratic norms. You know, maybe they're Trump voters, maybe they're Brexit voters, uh, maybe they are radicals, maybe they're extremists one way or the other. Um, and so we, we, we didn't design this, pro this project uh, uh, after 2016. So uh, we, we don't have all the variables that we would like to have right now if we were to design a new study about this. But at the same time, we have um, uh, tried to look, for example, at whether people with different ideologies respond differently to political experiences on social media. Um, and in particular, we were interested in whether people who are more extremist in their ideology, they're either hard left or hard right, whether they experience higher gains in their participation when they uh, encounter the political experiences on social media we focus on. And as you can see from these charts, this doesn't really seem to be the case. It's actually the more moderate voters that experience a slightly greater boost compared to the extremists on the left and on the right, and also to the ones that are um, unaligned, you know, the kinds of people that don't wanna see themselves as part of the left or the right. Um, and the same applies to voting for populist parties, although I'm not going to show you any data here, but basically we ran a lot of models where we try to differentiate between, you know, the effects of these experiences on, you know, a Trump voter 
or on a Hillary Clinton voter, on a Brexit voter, or on a Romaine voter, on a Podemos voter versus a Socialist Party of Spain voter, and we found no differences. So we don't see any evidence for a populist tide or an extremist tide, uh, uh, at least caused by the political experiences we are interested in. Finally, systemic features. Uh, this is where, as a comparativist, you know, I was most excited about, but I have to say this is where you know, we, we have the least uh, robust findings. Um, basically, we found that the, the people who encounter supportive political content on social media um, are more strongly, uh, more likely to participate uh, in politics when they live in majoritarian democracies uh, as opposed to proportional democratic systems. Um, and we argue that this is because political parties in majoritarian democracies tend to be broader, uh, bigger churches, um, and therefore they bring together voters of different perspectives. As a result, voters are less attached to their parties than in proportional systems where you have you know, your own party that cultivates exactly the, more, more closely the politics, the policies that you like. Um, and we do see that there is some evidence for this, for this effect. Um, we do not see any difference in terms of media systems. We theorize that accidental exposure to news on social media might have an effect on participation that varies depending on media systems. We used Holland and Mancini's typology with some tweaks, but we didn't find any, any differences in that regard. Um, and we did find some moderate evidence that electoral mobilization on social media increases participation more in uh, among people who live in systems that we classify as party-centric uh, political systems as opposed to candidate-centric. So in systems where parties are still meaningful and still contribute to the organization of politics, um, people will find more opportunities to participate on the ground than in systems that are more candidate-centric, where parties come and go and they're mostly electoral vehicles. And so when people get mobilized to act politically through social media, uh, they then go uh, to, uh, uh, to try and, and turn that, that propensity for action into real action, and they have an easier time doing that in party-centric systems than in candidate-centric systems. But this is a relatively small finding. As you can see here, the predicted probabilities, you know, they overlap in terms of their uh, confidence intervals, uh, but in a, in a regression, uh, the, uh, the coefficient was, was indeed significant. So you know, slightly, slightly more mixed evidence than uh, with regards to the first, to the first finding. Um, there are obviously a lot of limitations to uh, this work, even though it took a lot of time and a lot of resources to put together. It's based on observational data. Uh, it's based on cross-sectional data at one point in time. Uh, we're using online surveys, which are you know, second best to uh, classic representative samples based on lists of the population that are increasingly untenable in contemporary democracies. Uh, it's based on self-reports, of course, which is subject to all sorts of biases. And even though we improve on most research uh, that is uh, uh, not really comparative or only compares you know, three or four or five countries, uh, nine countries is really not enough to test uh, all the possible uh, associations that we would have liked to test uh, in the data with regards to the different uh, systemic features in different countries. Uh, but what contribution do we think we have made? Uh, first of all, we think we have helped uh, uh, those who argue that social media are more part of the solution than the problem, at least if you're interested in the decline of political participation and the weakening of political organizations across Western democracies. Now, granted, there are other problems in contemporary democracies that have come to the fore after 2016 and, and, and now with COVID. Uh, but if, we believe, if you believe that democracy requires people to participate, social media can help. Uh, also, social media are not necessarily the kinds of weapons of the strong that they have been theorized to be. Um, and in some respects, they may be closing participatory gaps rooted in different levels of political involvement, particularly between people who care more and less uh, about uh, politics, which, by the way, is a very stable variable across the life cycle. It doesn't really change as you grow older. You know, either you have it when you are in your, you know, you know, twenties, uh, and then you, 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 it stays with you, or, or you don't. And there, there is research that shows that. So if, you, if social media can close these gaps, these are pretty permanent gaps in people's attitudes. Uh, there's little evidence that social media are disproportionately mobilizing extremists or supporter of populist parties, uh, at least when it comes to their levels of participation. Again, they might have other effects in terms of, their, of the quality of the information they have, their political knowledge, conspiracy theories. This is not our focus, but when it comes to participation, they don't disproportionately mobilize them. Um, political institutions matter. 
um, and and uh, but but they matter less than individual level variables. Uh, and this is very interesting, you know. And again, as a comparativist, I was uh, uh, thinking I was going to find a lot more differences based on different systemic features. And the fact that this is not the case might be due to the fact that social media function pretty much in the same way across different countries. You know, public service media exist in many European democracies, but they're quite different. You know, the BBC is very different from the Italian public service broadcaster. But Facebook in Britain and Facebook in Italy work pretty much in the same way. So that might be a reason. And finally, I want to leave with, you know, a word of caution that, uh, you know, there is a normative ambiguity underlying the book. Um, our models quantify participation and look at whether participation goes up or down uh, based on a certain set of variables. Uh, but we don't subscribe to the assumption that more participation is good in itself. It could be participation aimed at suppressing other people's participation. It could be participation based on false information. It could be participation that uh, aims to destroy democratic norms. Uh, however, we do argue that political equality is uh, probably more, more, uh, more easily agreed upon democratic good. Uh, and we believe that some of our findings show that social media contribute to increasing some forms of political equality. Uh, that's all from me. Thanks very much for listening. Look forward to questions and, and, and comments. Thank you very much, Christian. I'm going to kind of keep my kind of remarks and, and, and questions brief um, so we can offer, have as much time for questions from the audience. But I wanted to start off with quite a big picture question because, you know, I really enjoyed reading the books in preparation, the book in preparation of today. And I think one of the most refreshing things that I found with the book was just how kind of like how transparent and open you are with the, the fact this is an, an optimistic book, that social media, I think you can describe it as moderately optimistic normative conclusions in terms of the, the takeaways from the book. Um, and the idea that social media is more part of the solution than part of the problem. And, and I really wanted to get your kind of takeaway in terms of, you know, the, the timing of that, that this book is, is particularly interesting when we consider wider trends in, in the literature in terms of like disinformation research, um, trolling, abuse, hate speech, news avoidance, etc. And, and I kind of wanted to, to, to ask you how you think this book and the contributions from it and, and that kind of key argument. And I think, you know, the big takeaway from me was the work around equality and the, the law of diminishing returns that you, you talk about in the book. How does this contribute to the current kind of like research conclusions and research agenda within the kind of wider research on social media and, and participation in democracy? Thanks, Dennis. And, and this is, you know, variations of this question have come up, you know, at, at most of the uh, venues in which I've presented, you know, even preliminary versions of this book and articles that, you know, laid the foundations for this book. I, I think there's various components to it. I mean, the first one is um, we need to be more subtle about how we operationalize and study political participation. Uh, people have talked, you know, Thorsten Quant has talked about dark participation. Uh, there is there is you know work that uh, suggests that that has focused on how um, groups that are difficult to study with uh, online surveys uh, can still make a very big difference and negative a negative one in most cases to democracy. I mean we are uh, a little a few days uh, uh, over uh, the the first uh, anniversary of the capital insurrection. Uh, that was not a large number of people, and it would be very very hard to study even the extended networks of those people through the kinds of methods we are using. You would need different kinds of methods, you know, ethnographic um, and much more specific, which would not be generalizable in the same way as the data uh, we, we show uh, should be. But that doesn't mean that this is not important, um, especially in countries that are experiencing these, these kinds of disruptions. Um, I think it, it, it's really uh, a question, you know, with, with social science research, um, there are different conclusions that you will draw depending on the dependent variable you're studying. Um, and in a way, uh, we made a very deliberate choice to study participation, um, partly because we think participation matters. Uh, surely an increase in participation is not an, 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 an unqualified public good. Uh, as I said, it could be animated by bad intentions. It could be uh, full of uh, people who are misinformed. Uh, it could be uh, led and, and, and uh, overtaken by, uh, taken advantage of by uh, right-wing authoritarians. But at the same time, um, it's hard to imagine a functioning democracy where the vast majority of people don't participate. Um, and so I think what 
what this book tries to tries to say is that procedural definitions of democracy based on you know citizens provide input the system registers the input and it returns an output that is you know democratic that is closer to public opinion only take you so far when you are dealing with massive changes in political norms uh, and massive political changes due to you know all the challenges of the 21st century that our political systems aren't dealing with very well that being said uh, we do not see, to the extent that our data allow us to see, very strong evidence that these increases in participation that we document are disproportionately concentrated among the people that are causing problems, so to speak, in our political systems. You know, we don't see, you know, Trump voters benefiting more than Hillary Clinton voters. We don't see Brexit voters benefiting more than Remain voters. Um, so while it is, you know, sometimes convenient to both you know when things are going relatively well to attribute all of those uh goods to one source uh and when things are not going well it's like oh it's social media's fault it's facebook's fault uh unfortunately realities are usually a lot more complicated than that and i think what what some of the null findings we report in the book about for example ideological extremism and populism and even echo chambers you know even the fact that we don't see a lot of evidence that echo chambers are so widespread. They don't, they don't mean that these are not important problems, but they do mean that if you want to look at the reasons why these problems occur, uh, you need to go a little beyond you know, uh, social media per se, and you need to look at the array of forces that shape these problems. For example, if you look at misinformation, you know, I see Ben O'Loughlin in the audience, you know, Ben and I and, and Andy Chadwick wrote an article where we showed that uh, tabloids are responsible for a lot of misinformation shared on social media uh, in the UK. And so, you know, tabloids are, you know, uh, journalistic organizations with people calling themselves journalists working there. Uh, so social media might be the channel for that misinformation, but it doesn't originate there. Uh, and so uh, social realities, unfortunately, are more complex than easy narratives about, you know, Facebook is destroying democracy. Uh, uh, would, would suggest. At the same time, you know, I, I, I also don't subscribe to the, you know, optimistic notion that everything is fine and we need to look for problems elsewhere. There are substantial problems with the way political information circulates these days. Uh, but this is not what the book focuses on uh, uh, specifically. This is not how we designed our surveys. And so we can see relatively little about these, uh, these more recent concerns. Thank you, Christian. And before I kind of like move on to, to audience questions, I also wanted to ask about kind of, I suppose a conceptual question, because I think one of the one of the really interesting sections of the book, and I'd highly recommend those that haven't read it and kind of are working in this space, it's something that I think I'm going to take away from my work are the, are the chapters in which you engage, in, engage with the definitional work in terms of what political participation is and what the influences of political participation is, political participation are. And I mean, I, you know, thinking about your, your overall argument around equality and, you know, I've already mentioned to you how much I like the vignettes in the book, but there's a, there's a vignette in chapter one where you talk about um, the Netflix documentary, Knock Down a House, and a voter who kind of turns up and, 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 and says how they saw kind of a two minute video on social media and that inspired them to vote. And it made me think of kind of, it kind of took me back to my PhD days and some of the slacktivism literature and how people might think, well, that's not, you know, the, some of the, the issues about the, the types of participation that you kind of define under the, the tertiary influence in terms of participation online that seeks to either change people's views or influence behaviors. And it made me think, is there an issue more broadly within, within the literature here that we focus too much on, as you described them, political junkies in terms of the, the, the research on social media and participation? And does this, I mean, one of the things I found really interesting in those conceptual chapters in, was the was the engagement you were doing in terms of what it means to be and kind of what I want you to kind of elaborate on is what it means to be a politically active and engaged citizen. Because I think you what you do with the definition in the in the influence work is you kind of critically think about um, some of those those definitions and um, you know, the, the, the significance and importance that these you know for people who who would be described as not necessarily the most politically active the importance of those kind of like forms of social media engagement can have in terms of their, their broader participation so i kind of just wanted to get you to reflect on kind of what you and augusto conceptualize as being a politically active and engaged citizen and if there is a problem more broadly within the research on social media and, and participation or within the maybe more popular discussion 
of social media and participation um, about how we might conceptualize what it means to be an active citizen. Yeah, thanks. That's 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 a great question, Dennis. And you know, your I I would I would go as far as to say that you know in in the book we we take issue, for example, with the you know uh, uh, with with the most exaggerated discussions of echo chambers uh, and clicktivism and slacktivism plays a similarly negative role in our view in the literature. And thankfully, you know, work like yours, Dennis, has uh, clarified that we need to be more inclusive when we think about the ways in which people participate uh, politically. Uh, the, the, the classics in the political science literature were written at a time when the only ways in which people could influence each other were by knocking on, were by knocking on someone's door, which you would normally do because you were volunteering for a party. So it wasn't really a spontaneous activity that you would do. It was something that was instructed by others. Uh, or, you know, the, the, the classic, um, kitchen table or water cooler or coffee machine conversations. Um, and, and, pol and, and political scientists overlooked the importance of these activities, I think partly because they were a lot rarer um, and, and only people who were really, really engaged in politics would dare, you know, bring up politics at the, at the water cooler and with their colleagues. Uh, social media have changed that. Uh, for better or worse, they have, because even though most people don't engage with a lot of political content on social media, most people are in, are in contact with a lot of others on social media. And all it takes is that some of those people will want to push some information out on social media for you to be at least uh, potentially likely to see it, even though you don't care. And so the significance of these small scale acts of you know, sharing news, commenting, sharing your frustration, uh, this goes beyond um, a click. This goes beyond, uh, you know, the, the you know activities in cyberspace, as as it used to be called. It it can and does our findings show um, reach to people that are not normally particularly engaged in in political conversations. They don't follow the news very closely, um, and again, this can have both positive and negative impacts, and also. Uh, it shouldn't be overestimated. I mean, it will still be a small, very, very tiny proportion of people's uh, of the information people come across on social media. You know, there is good data out there, not data we collected, that says that on Facebook, more or less 3% of the stuff people see has to do with news. 3% is not a lot. But if you spend three and a half hours per day on Facebook, 3% of that is, you know, it's a decent amount of time is probably equivalent up to a couple of um, you know, news stories on, on the BBC news. So not insignificant if you're not the kind of person that would get the news out of their own volition. But how do how do those news get to you? Because other people have shared it. And that's why we believe, you know, and I'm talking about news sharing, but I could talk about, you know, sharing petitions or just even sharing angry comments about, you know, anything in, in, in contemporary politics, of which there is a lot to be angry about, uh, or sharing a funny meme or sharing a GIF. Uh, these are, you know, from the view, from the point of view of the individual who does the sharing, are small scale activities for sure, uh, and that's why they were criticized, you know, initially, uh, as being inconsequential and lame, and you know, not a substitute for real world participation. But when you add them up, um, and you consider that for a lot of people, that's most of the politics they're going to engage with on a given day, uh, that could be, you know, significant. But in order for us to recognize that significance, we need to consider as forms of participation, the attempt to change other people's minds out of your own volition informally, not because you have signed up for a party or a campaign and they've instructed you with some talking points to go knock on people's doors, which is a different form of participation that is very important and can you know, affect turnout, for example, we know from research, uh, but it's a different thing compared to what we're talking about here, which is much more informal, continuous, and 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 widespread even though you know slightly superficial in terms of how mu how much engagement it requires uh on on a single on a single shop thank you christian i really appreciate those the, your responses to my questions i'm going to pass over to the the audience now we've got just shy of 20 minutes left for audience questions um if there are two ways for you to ask questions either pop them in the uh, chat box or if anyone would like to turn on their microphone uh, and camera and ask a question if you want to raise your hand uh, and ask a question um, on the call, that would also be very much appreciated. Um, I 
can't see any hands raised at the moment. So I can see we've got a question in the chat box. Um, uh, you mentioned that by quantifying political participation, it does not mean that there is be uh, that there more is better because of factors such as the motivations behind participation. What kind of data did you decide to eliminate from your sample slash uh, variables? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, we we didn't eliminate any any data in terms of uh, the activities that people reported participating in. Uh, precisely because we didn't feel comfortable doing that. Uh, you know, you could say, well, many people who voted for Donald Trump uh, wanted to restrict civil rights. Uh, but does that mean that as a social scientist, we can you know, eliminate participation by those people as uh, democratic participation? Well, if we knew that that's the reason why they participate, you know, maybe, but uh, we didn't have those kinds of variables in our data set, we only knew their ideology, who they voted for, and all those other variables that I that I listed in, in one of the slides. Uh, so one of the challenges we discuss in the in the book in, in the conclusions is what would it look like for social scientists to start saying, OK, political participation is not a good in itself. Let's differentiate between participation that expands democracy and participation that limits it. Uh, this is something we should do, and I hope you know some people will do it. I'm, working with some colleagues to try and figure some of these issues out uh, but it poses a lot of challenges especially for doing a survey uh, it's very difficult to get people to admit in a survey that you know they they would storm the capital if their candidates didn't win uh, we know that some people think that and we know that some people actually did that sadly uh, but it's very difficult to get those people to tell a social scientist in, a, in an online survey that they would um, it's very difficult to, for example, get people to admit that they used hate speech uh, and on social media, uh, by and large, because most people don't recognize what they say as hate speech. You know, they say, ah, oh, that was not sexism. It was just a joke. That was not racism. I was just being funny. Uh, so I think in, in, in this particular, when using this particular method, the, the, the idea of being able to parse out participation based on whether it advances democracy or it challenges democracy it, inv it involves you know uh, hate speech intolerance misinformation uh, is very difficult in a survey context uh, it might be easier to do when looking at real world social media data uh, of which sadly social scientists uh, don't have uh, enough access to uh, because the platforms hold on to the data and don't share it uh, if we did that, then if we had that kind of data, then there would be other challenges, including, you know, how do we define an operationalized, you know, intolerance and hate speech at scale? But there are some people that are trying to address these issues, of course, uh, in, in our research communities. Uh, so I, I think for, for, that, for that kind of enterprise, uh, you would need to uh, look more carefully at people's attitudes if you're looking at, at survey data uh, and develop really good measures of, you know, populism, uh, anti-democratic norms, conspiracy beliefs, which, you know, there's plenty, um, and, and, and really look at how those variables might shape how social media affect political participation. Uh, we couldn't, uh, we didn't have those variables in, in our research, uh, and so unfortunately we, uh, we could not answer those questions directly. Thank you, Christian, and thank you to Dr. Al Ali for the question. And we have another question in the chat box from uh, Juan Morales. Uh, have you looked at overall differences in your estimated effects separated by individual countries and grouping majoritarian versus proportional system countries, perhaps the US and the UK being such special cases, uh, could uh, could be driving some of the differences you find rather than the political system? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question, Juan. And, and yeah, we looked, um, you know, we looked at the individual countries as uh, as, as moderators as well. Um, we, we, find, we found that these patterns are generally robust uh, if you disaggregate the countries. Um, you have uh, obviously um, more, more variables in your, uh, in your model and uh, as a result um, you need more power uh, than we had to properly estimate those relationships at, the, at, the, at adequate levels. Um, but uh, we do see that broadly speaking uh, the countries that are majoritarian for example uh, behave in similar ways as the countries uh, to, to each other and the countries that are proportionals are all you know on the lower end of the scale but I but I want to emphasize that you know the the relationships we found are are relatively weak uh, and so I think the 
the bigger picture here has probably more to do with the lack of strong differences between these nine democracies in terms of the relationships we studied than with any you know major breakthrough finding that you know oh people in majoritarian democracies are much more uh, boosted in their participation by uh, for example encountering agreeing political viewpoints we do find some difference and it's not a negligible difference uh, but i say you know if i if i was to read this book as a graduate student i would you know either try to conduct a study with more countries um, or you know come away with, uh, uh, with 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 the idea that uh, you know maybe it's it's still not right to project the results of one country into other countries without you know critically examining them but at the same time our findings show that the differences might not be as big as as they are for example for traditional media systems and i think one of the reasons could be that you know the function of social media so far in western democracies is very similar it might start to differ to uh, diverge if countries adopt different regulations. So if the European Union adopts some regulations of social media, but you know Britain doesn't or the US doesn't, then I would expect to see bigger differences at, at that time. Thank you, Christian. We have a, another question. Thank you, Catherine Boltmer for, for this question. Congratulations on this great study. My question is about agreement, disagreement. One could assume that most disagreement actually occurs between partisan, like-minded people, because these are the people whose opinion you care about. This would be a more nuanced notion of bubbles, diversity within uniformity. Was it possible to distinguish in your survey data between this slash agreement within same partisan and opposed partisan contexts? Thanks, Catherine. That's a brilliant question. Um, I think it's a very valid point. Um, we didn't distinguish um, between these kinds of agreement and disagreement. And I think your argument is is very plausible. It could be that, you know, I say that I disagree with people because I see people from my same party articulate slightly different versions of, uh, of the party line. Um, and, and so this is possible. Um, there are limits to what you can do with, with surveys. Uh, you know, you ask people, how often do you agree with people? How often do you, do you disagree with people? And then you could, in theory, also ask them, oh, but are these people that you would think come from the same party? Are these people that you would think, you know, support different parties? Uh, I, I think the more you ask, the more uh, unreliable uh, these self-reports end up being, uh, largely because people have very little sense of what, what happens to their everyday lives on social media. They are so uh, constantly bombarded by messages that, you know, there, there are limits to how much you can ask them to remember. Uh, that being said, I think the interesting phenomenon we observed in the, in the book uh, and with the data, and I didn't uh, show the data in my presentation, is that the question whether there are echo chambers or not on social media is not a, an absolute, you know, cannot have an absolute answer. To us, it's always uh, an interesting question to the extent that we compare social media with other environments. Uh, and so we actually asked similar questions in terms of agreement and disagreement, focused on face-to-face -face conversations, um, political news on TV and newspapers, and in a more limited subset of countries, uh, political interactions on mobile messaging apps like WhatsApp. And what was interesting about this was that we found that there are a lot more echo chambers in face-to-face -face conversation. That's where people mostly report that they either are exposed to balanced uh, mixes of opinions or they're predominantly exposed to people they agree with, not disagree with. Television, unsurprisingly, and newspapers were the most diverse uh, sources uh, where most people argued that they would see information they disagree with more frequently than agree with. And we know that this is one of the functions of traditional broadcast media in general, uh, in spite of the you know, importance of partisan media in some countries. Um, and we found that private messaging apps are kind of like between social media and interpersonal communication. So they, there's quite a lot of agreement on those platforms because they are uh, places where we engage with our strong ties with people um, that are you know, closer to us, um, as opposed to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, where we have these like widespread, uh, diverse, imagined audiences, as Dana Boyd and, and Alice Marvick call them. Uh, where, you know, there's there's a bunch of everything, you know, people we know very well, people we don't really know, people we don't know at all, uh, celebrities and so on and so forth. Um, so 
what what even though we cannot answer the question in in, in so precisely as, as Catherine rightly points out we, we we could have what we do see is that uh, if social media are echo chambers they are much less of an echo chamber than face-to-face -face conversation much less of an echo chamber than uh, whatsapp facebook messenger snapchat and these other increasingly popular messaging apps uh, and only on traditional broadcast media, you know, good old journalism, can we see uh, more diversity in the political views that people get exposed to uh, than on social media. Thanks, Christian. We have uh, another question in the comments. And uh, also, again, if, if anyone wants to kind of ask a question as well with their mic, do please raise your hand on Zoom and, and I'll come to you. We have a question here from, from Jason Searle. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation, Christian. I was wondering whether your findings found any difference in terms of political participation or engagement with political material between different social media types, between different users of Twitter or YouTube, for example. Uh, thanks, that's, that's another great question. Uh, so we didn't ask people whether, you know, did you see information you agree with on Facebook or on YouTube uh, or on Instagram? Uh, again, because uh, we felt, you know, this would be asking too much in terms of people recalling, you know, what happened and where. However, we did ask how often people use uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, uh, and YouTube. Uh, we also included Google Plus because at the time that's that that existed. Um, and we do see that these platforms matter in terms of how often people encounter the political experiences we're studying. So for example, um, if you use uh, Facebook a lot, you are more likely to encounter opinions you disagree with. Uh, if you use Twitter a lot, that's the opposite. So we can see that different platforms can lead to slightly different outcomes in terms of political experiences on social media. If you use Facebook a lot, you are a lot more likely to encounter uh, news accidentally, um, which again confirms the role of Facebook as this sort of like big marketplace uh, where everything, you know, everyone is, or at least everyone was, you know, until until the end of our of our field work. Um, and so, uh, and, and the same for political mobilization. The more people use Facebook, uh, the more likely they are to be exposed to messages that try to uh, convince them to vote one way uh, or another. And so uh, what, what we see from these analyses is that um, Facebook had, at least you know, between 2015 and 2018, a, a key central role in uh, all these information flows. Um, and that, uh, particularly to, for exposing people to uh, information that doesn't come from uh, their own political uh, viewpoints, uh, it's a very important source of information. Uh, Twitter, unsurprisingly, is, is much more of an actual echo chamber, um, which is not surprising because people go to Twitter for politics uh, and, and, and people who are political uh, are more interested in being in an echo chamber than people who are non-political. Thank you, Christian. I can't see any more questions, so I'm gonna use this opportunity to ask the final question, if that's okay, Christian, and it's, and it's one that relates to the title of the book, I suppose, and also kind of like the impact of the book on kind of like public debate and popular discourse around echo chambers and filter bubbles. Um, as I was reading this book, kind of preparing for today, I was reading it over Christmas at home and my stepdad like commented on the title, like saying, you know, the typical, oh, you know, social media. This is also coming from someone who like exclusively consumes talk radio, but still, you know, all, all social media is just echo chambers, filter bubbles, etc. You just, you know, amplifying your own messages about Corbyn was his example. Um, and, it, and, it, and again, obviously in the book, you know, I've got a quote here where you kind of um, refer to these echo chambers and filter bubbles as being um, at best exaggerated, at worst unfounded. And I will kind of, prior to before today, I also looked at the Hansard data in, in terms of use of the term, but also Google Trends data, just like after 2016, the explosion in terms of the use of both terms in popular discourse. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to kind of say, what does the book say to that debate? And, and what does the book say, you know, these terms that have been popularized, especially within news discourse, kind of what does the book contribute to our understanding of these two terms? 
Well, thanks, Dennis. I, uh, I testified in front of a House of Lords uh, Committee on Democracy uh, a couple of years ago, or three years ago, maybe. And, and you know, that's one of the questions I was asked. And, and I gave the answer that I give in the book that echo chambers exist for some people. And uh, those people uh, are already highly politicized. They would probably be in an echo chamber even if they, if even at, at the newsstand, because they would buy newspapers that they already agree with. Um, and these people don't change their minds because of political information. Uh, we know from all the literature on voting behavior that uh, people who have strong political views don't change them very easily. It's the people in the middle or people who are alienated that are more likely to ebb and flow. Um, the debate on echo chambers, I think, has has been st steered by a variety of factors. One is that the term echo chambers is a very effective metaphor. And I think the people like me and others, there's plenty of great researchers, you know, Grant Blank and Elizabeth Dubois, um, the, 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 the Richard Fletcher and Rasmus Nielsen and their colleagues at the Oxford uh, uh, Reuters Institute, um, who, who have, you know, uh, empirically demonstrated that these concerns are exaggerated. Um, we haven't come up with a better metaphor. Uh, and I think this is a, a, partly how public debate works. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, we're still trying to find it. It's also difficult to come up with a metaphor to, to debunk something that has become so popular. I think we would need to, we would need to move on to, to focusing on something different. The other reason, I think, is that most political commentators and most politicians are in an echo chamber on social media uh, because they are exactly the kinds of people who being more political caring about politics um, they their social media feeds don't look like the social media feeds of ordinary people uh, many academics are also in echo chambers uh, because we also care more about politics than average and so our own findings would lead you to would lead us to predict that these kinds of people would be much more likely to be in an echo chamber than the average person in the street. Uh, and I think what the, the reason why the, the debate has developed in this way is, you know, political and journalistic and academic elites projecting their own experiences into the experiences of the average person in the street who uh, doesn't spend a lot of time talking about politics, but spends a lot of time on social media. And when they do, they don't really think too much about, do I want to only seek political content I agree with? Uh, largely because they don't see they don't see much of it. Um, I do think that the you know the debate about echo chambers is uh, uh, problematic because it, uh, it it legitimizes uh, ideas about, um, for example, we need to have a pluralistic debate between those who stormed the Capitol and those who opposed it. And uh, it, it has become very easy. I was watching, you know, the, the uh, capital uh, uh, attacks commemoration in the US. It has become very easy for uh, politicians who are at least winking to anti-democratic positions to say, oh, but we need to get everyone needs to get out of their echo chambers. I mean, come on, everyone is guilty of the same of the same crime. Everyone is not engaging with the other side. And I think there is a problem when you know, the other side is engaged in destroying democracy um, and uh, or in spreading misinformation or in telling us not to get a vaccine because vaccines cause, you know, diseases. Uh, and so I think uh, one of the adverse implications of uh, uh, this relentless focus on echo chambers is that uh, it has created this false equivalence between the people who are in an echo chamber of epidemiologists and scientists who tell them this is, what, this is what we need to do. This is what science tells us we need to do to fight COVID and the echo chamber of the anti-vaxxers or the, the anti-lockdowns or, you know, the, those who think that COVID is just, just, a, this is just, just a flu or imported by China or, or you know, created by China or something like that. So I think the, you know, as, as the term fake news, you know, and before the term fake news, it has become this sort of like political football that is used to uh, either delegitimize, you know, the opposition or to create this sense of false equivalence that I don't think particularly help us um, overcome the challenges that we need to face as, as uh, democracies and as uh, modern political regimes. Thank you, Christian. And also, we're, we're at five o'clock now, so I want to uh, say a real big thank you for volunteering your time today to present your new book, The Augusto, to, to us and to, to everyone here. And, and thank you to everyone here for coming along as well. 
Um, just to say that if you are interested in watching previous seminars, you can find them on, on our YouTube channel. And if you want to be notified of future seminars, just ask one of the co-conveners, Katie, Emily, myself, um, or Jen or, or Alec, and we can add you to our mailing list. But otherwise, have a lovely evening and I'll hopefully see some of you digitally or in person soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. And I joined Dennis in saying let's hope to see each other very, very soon. Stay safe.